Steve Little is superintendent of the Asheville Interagency Hotshot Crew, one of only three hotshot programs in the nation specifically designed to develop future fireline supervisors. Since 1999, Steve has been responsible for training 17 new crew members each year. In the following podcast, Steve describes various techniques he uses in teaching firefighters how to develop ballpark fire behavior estimates using basic weather observations and the Fireline Handbook. Fire behavior and weather is, is the basis of everything we're doing because, you know, everything we do, current expected fire behavior. So if I, can, if I can get good feedback that that individual is understanding what, what are our significant factors, are we running low RHs, are we running pretty high winds, are we in steep topography, is it a light flashy fuel or is the fire actually up in the canopy and, and moving above our heads, spotting potential, spotting distance, and, and all those things that, that I have a good ballpark figure for because I do on a regular basis rely, rely back on the, the fire behavior appendix in the, in the fire line handbook because they do have the charts that are ballpark figure. And, and I know fire behavior, there's a good art and science to it, but in, in our world, because it, it is ever-changing minute by minute, that's really all I need for a, a good plan is a ballpark figure, and I try to keep it simple. Some simple weather observations, and it, they have to be proficient on knowing where to find the information. I, I encourage everybody to tab the sections of the fire line handbook. Um, and tab those specific sections in the fire behavior appendix so that it is a quick reference. That's how it's intended. Um, so in just a few minutes with, with basic weather observations, they can go to the fire line handbook, figure out what fuel model we'll, we're dealing with, and then go to those charts and have a good idea. And, and it, it takes a little bit of a learning curve. To, you know, some people, their fire line handbook was given to them in 13190 and it became a paperweight. I would say the, the, what, what they, they need to learn and become proficient at is how the book is set up and where to find the charts. Because they'll spend more time flipping pages if they haven't gone back and, like I've mentioned before, tabbed that appendix. Tab the pages you know that we're going to use on a regular basis. So it is, as it was designed, as a quick reference. Because they'll spend five, if they're not exactly sure where it is, they'll spend more time flipping for pages than if they actually knew where the page was and came up with an answer. I didn't know as far as the, the long-term projections and things like that, but I could take my fire line handbook as a squad boss and figure fire behavior. And if you can't do that, you're not going to have a full understanding of where the whole concept of fire behavior will take you because there are too many things out there that affect it. I could teach fire behavior to a fifth grader in just a matter of hours in ballpark figures. They don't need to understand the whole concept of where the math comes from. They don't need to understand the whole concept of what fine fuel moisture is, thousand dollar that. But for them to take a number value, put it into an equation which the charts are based off of, take that number value and use those charts, it's just a matter of knowing which chart to look at. Everything we do based on current and expected fire behavior, can you see the main fire, are you in contact with anyone who can, and all the, all the things that relate to the 10 and 18. And, and, and especially with when we're figuring fire behavior, we correlate that to the 10 and 18. And, and as we've learned over the last few years, that's how the 10 fire orders were designed as you know, a progression, gathering information, making decisions. With the watch-out situations, again, you may have one watch-out situation. I try to teach my folks, let's figure out just how many watch-out situations we have, and the more watch-out situations that you have for whatever you're dealing with, the more likelihood you need to step back and get more information or mitigate those, those factors until you really get to a point where you feel you can engage the situation. The basics being what is fire behavior? What dictates fire behavior? What affects fire behavior? Back to the fire triangle. You better have a good concept of, of the fire triangle because once you go from there and you think of all the things that affect fuel moisture, fuel loading, fuel continuity, all the things that affect 
the fuel types in certain geographic areas, all the changes that the weather will bring about from one day period to a five day period to a five month period. If you don't understand the basics and become proficient and, and very confident in your knowledge as you progress, you're not going to have as well of an understanding and a confidence level to where if you just complete class by class by class up to even 490 because I mean it's been uh, 12 years ago since I took 490 but the advantage I had is prior to that because of my supervisors I could do all that by hand I could do the nomogram The first thing I consider is, is what's driving the fire. Uh, and typically in, in uh, the mountain areas of the southeast, it's the light flashy fuels of the leaf litter and the needle cast. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be dealing, based on the fuel moisture of those light flashy fuels, um, we could be dealing with a fire that's, that's, not, being, that's not moving very fast ba because those fuels change from daylight to dark and back again throughout the day. So I just try to get an idea, do you understand what, what the fire's burning in and what those, those fuel conditions are now? I'm a worst case scenario type person. I usually plan for the hottest, driest expectations on the weather forecast. Um, usually the windiest conditions expected, always anticipating those wind shifts, the changes in topography and those types of things. So I, I think of it, in, and also the changes throughout the day. It's 10 o'clock in the morning now, and here's your plan, did you consider at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, where's your crew going to be and how does that relate to the fire behavior you're going to encounter at that location? And have you accounted for the fact that the fire is probably going to be moving twice as fast? So your escape route and safety zone probably needs to be closer proximity. Um, best ideas, you know, always taking fire with you if you can, those types of things. Mm -hmm. Just little pieces of feedback to make sure they understand that we're dealing with fire right here, right now, but we're also going to be dealing with this same fire a mile or two down the road in four or five hours where it's hotter and drier. I look at the what, what do I feel will be the hottest part of the day and what those temperatures will be. What do I feel will be the driest part of the day with my relative humidity. What do I feel is going to be my strongest wind and how long do I think that, you know, is it going to be gusts or is it sustained wind? And I usually deal with the sustained winds because the gusts you'll never be able to keep the gusts in the back of your mind because you know they're going to happen but you don't know when and where. But the sustained wind, what's that maximum sustained wind going to be throughout the day? So the hottest, the driest, and the windiest conditions. And if I plan for that, and I've got a contingency for my operation based on those factors. If and when all those factors line up, I'm prepared for it. Observations on weather, and, and that's something I teach everybody in my program, is how to figure fine dead fuel moisture based on your weather and how to figure probability of ignition. Everybody in my program from, from the very first days we spend, um, we do have about six weeks of training. And when we train as a crew, that's one of the things that everybody learns how to do in the Fireline Handbook is figure the, the fine dead fuel moisture because again in, in a lot of the fires we deal with that's what drives the fire is fine dead fuel moisture. So everybody knows how to figure that. Take a step back because you know people inherently feel rushed to make decisions. They inherently feel that dead air is bad air or you know you ask me a question if I don't have the answer right away something's wrong or I'm stupid. So let's take a few minutes, let's rethink this problem, let's look at all the things that we need to think about, let's start with the basics. How do those basic factors affect what you're trying to make as far as a fire behavior prediction? Okay, let's, let's start with step one. I need this information, this information, and this information. You know, temperature, relative humidity. Okay, do you have that? No, you don't. Well, you might want to call down on the crew and have somebody start taking the weather. All right, let's go from there. We get the weather. Um, so we get the weather. Let's get our book out. Do you remember what page we need to figure probability of ignition? Where's the basic starting point to get those correction values? Okay, let's turn to that page. 
Okay, show me on the chart where you get that value, and then let's flip back through and make those adjustments for the, the time of year we're dealing with and the time of day. Great, you've got that value. Let's go back to the chart, and let's see how that's going to dictate into the situation we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got that value. Well, let's look around. What, what fuel model do you think this fire is, is burning in? Okay, we've, we've got that fuel model. Let's go to those charts in the back because we've got our weather information. What, what kind of topography do we have? Is it flat? What percent slope do you think it is? Okay, now you, you, you're telling me it's 45% slope. Okay, look, we found our fuel model. And then based on slope, there's the chart that you need to look at there. Let's look at these values and follow across the chart. And here is a ballpark figure of what you could expect on your rates of spread. I try to correlate things that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the example I use with the fine dead fuel moisture are strips of paper. Imagine a strip of paper or a piece of newspaper that lays out in your front yard. When the dew collects on it, it's going to absorb that moisture. After about two or three hours of sunshine, it begins to dry out. The same thing with the leaves and the needles. As far as the, the 10 hour fuels, if you take that one sheet of newspaper and roll it up the size of a cigar. It takes a lot longer, longer for it to become saturated. It's also going to take it longer to dry back out. So examples like that, uh, the duff layer I equate to a sponge. Just little things that they can correlate with of what they're looking for. Is the sponge wet or dry? Um, what's keeping the sponge from drying out? Um, is it because of the leaf litter? Is it because the canopy's closed? All the little things that would affect that part of the fire environment. Mm -hmm. Just try to correlate things they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. If the, if the wind's 5 to 10 miles an hour, that's a, a good ballpark figure. Or is it 10 to 15 miles an hour? If it's 5 or 6 miles an hour, that's not going to make me or break me. But as you approach those, those thresholds of sustained winds at a, at a strong speed, um, or you know there's an approaching front that's, that's a dry front behind it, um, but you can, there's all types of ways of gathering that information. I just make sure whatever method they use that they've got enough of that information to have a good idea of what to expect with the fire. I, I try to teach them the skills and the tools that they can take anywhere in the country. Because once you're, once you're carted, once you're in the system, whether you're a firefighter type 2 or you're an IC type 1, you have the potential to be anywhere, anytime on a wildfire in any part of this country. And they need to fully understand that, especially at the crew boss level. The, the analogy I give them on the very first day is we're teaching people that are going to be responsible for your brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters. You need to make sure you know what it takes to do the job. And figuring fire behavior is just a small part of it, but being able to understand the fire behavior is what relates directly back to what we do with safety. Steve Little realizes that neither he nor his crew has the luxury of having perfect information or intricate computer models to estimate fire behavior throughout the day on the fire line. But Little shows a masterful ability to improvise an on-the-spot solution to this dilemma by using two simple tools readily available to every firefighter, the belt weather kit and the fire line handbook. Is every firefighter on your crew trained to use the fire behavior charts in the fire line handbook? Do they know how to properly use the simple instruments in the belt weather kit? Using these two tools, can you and your crew quickly, within five minutes or less, develop a ballpark fire behavior forecast?